Well, it's a, a pleasure uh, to have uh, Joel Fine from Neurste Libre de Bruxelles, uh, who will tell us about knots, minimal surfaces, and j holomorphic curves. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. So it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you all, thanks to the, the magic of Zoom. Um, so my my title today is here, here on the screen. So it's knots, minimal surfaces, and geolomorphic curves. And the, the basic idea is very simple to state. Um, so we're going to take a, a knot K or a link inside the three sphere. And I want to think of the three sphere as the ideal boundary of hyperbolic four space. So you have this knot or link sitting out at infinity. Um, however you want to visualize it, either the, the ball model or the half space model, and there's, there's knots on the boundary at infinity. And what we want to do is we want to look at minimal surfaces inside hyperbolic four space, which run out to infinity and meet the boundary at infinity in this K. And the hope is that you can count these minimal surfaces. So I, I should stress that this, this knot is oriented. So we've chosen a direction in which we want to run around it. And the minimal surfaces that we want to count, they will also be oriented. And the orientations should agree, you see. So if you, if you orient the surface, then the boundary is automatically oriented as well, as well. Okay, so we want to count oriented minimal surfaces in hyperbolic four space that run out to infinity and meet the, the boundary in this knot or link. And the idea is that not only can you count these things, but that the answer should be an invariant in the in the sense of topology. So if you make a an isotopy of your knot or link to another one, the number of minimal surfaces shouldn't change. Okay, so I, I wrote hope there. When when the minimal surface is just a disk, this is actually it's not just a hope; it's a theorem. Um, so uh, and and now comes the probably the most disappointing moment of the talk, at least for me. So I thought it was a theorem for all minimal surfaces. I put the paper on the archive just before Christmas and then went on holiday, very pleased with myself. And then about a month ago, I found a mistake in my proof, which is very sad. Um, so the, the main technical work in the paper isn't at all affected by the proof. Instead, it's my na the naive way in which I put together all the pieces. So when the, when the minimal surface has higher genus or more boundary components, there's a mistake in the proof. I'll explain where the problem lies and how I'm hopefully going to fix it. I, th I thought at first I would write the, the solution to the fix very quickly. I don't think the problem is very difficult. The problem is I have very little time at the moment. So uh, um, I think I'm probably going to have to just put a warning on the paper and then get back to it over the summer. Anyway, I'll explain the problem. Okay, so let's just pretend for a minute the paper was true and that we really did have these these link invariants given by counting minimal surfaces so the first dream that one might have is that this link invariant is actually something that's already known to not theorists that it's some classical link invariant and that that would be really exciting because people have done enormous numbers of calculations of these invariants and so these standard topological calculations would then become existence theorems for minimal surfaces you see so you'd you'd write down your link you'd know secretly that the minimal surfaces were counted by i don't know coefficients of some link polynomial you could compute the coefficients using a skein diagram or a skein relation or something like this and then that would give you non-vanishing of the coefficients which would in turn mean there had to be lots of minimal surfaces that fill the, the link, which would be a fantastic result because it's very hard to find minimal surfaces. You have to solve a nonlinear PDE. Okay, so pursuing this, this line of thought, what, what sort of invariant might we have? And I just want to briefly mention that these minimal surfaces, they come with two topological parameters. So one is pretty obvious. It's the genus of the surface that's in the filling. And the other one is something that I'm calling the self-linking number. So almost certainly this is this is already known to topologists, but anyway, here, here we go. So here's, here's how this works. So just to give the definition, I'm going to pretend that the minimal surface is embedded. It's important to emphasize that the minimal surfaces that we count, they won't necessarily embedded, they'd be embedded. They could be immersed, they could be branched, they could have all sorts of singularities. But this definition is slick and easy to give in the case when the surface is embedded. So when, when we're embedded, there's a normal bundle over our surface. 
And because the surface is oriented, if we fix an orientation of H4, this N is an oriented two-plane bundle. So it's just like a complex line bundle. And complex line bundles over surfaces with boundary, they're automatically trivial. You see, because there's no H2, because we've got a, we've got a boundary. And so we can trivialize it. We can choose a, a nowhere vanishing section. So that's this N. I forgot to write in the notes here that it's nowhere vanishing, but it absolutely should be nowhere vanishing. Okay, so and now if you look at what happens near the boundary, so this minimal surface runs out to the boundary and it meets the boundary at right angles. That's a consequence of minimality. Maybe later on in the talk, I'll explain why that's true. And so this vector that's normal to the surface on the boundary, it's normal to the knot. So this choice of section has given me a framing of my knot at infinity, and I can just push the knot off itself in the direction of n and compute the self-linking number, the linking number of this knot together with its framing. See how many times the push off winds around itself. And that's a number, that's an integer, and it doesn't depend upon n at all because, I mean, it depends upon the framing, but if I change the framing in such a way that it extends to a section over the whole surface, the number doesn't change. So it's a exercise in, 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 in algebraic topology to check that's, that's true. And, uh, and so these, these minimal surfaces, they come with these two numbers, genus and self-linking number. And we can try then and count minimal fillings of, of the knot with a, with a fixed genus and a fixed self-linking number. So now our, our invariants are indexed by two parameters. And so you can package them together somehow. I'm deliberately not saying how in order to produce a polynomial in two variables. And so that's what we'll expect to be finding in this in this game. If or when the, the, the minimal surface invariants are completely rigorously defined, they should lead to a two variable polynomial, which one hopes might be equal to a classical not polynomial, such as the Homfly PT polynomial or, or something like this. OK, so I'll, I'll, I'll give extra motivation to believe that it really is Homfly a little bit in a little bit of time. But first of all, I need to mention what this has got to do with geomorphic curves. So the, these minimal surface counts, it doesn't just look a little bit like gromov witten theory in the sense that we're counting surfaces. It really is gromov witten theory in the sense that we're actually counting geomorphic curves. But the, the geomorphic condition isn't in H4, it's in its twister space. So I'll, I'll tell you later what twister space is if you haven't seen it before, but just for now, um, it's enough to know that it's a, a two-sphere bundle, Z, that's the twister space, is a special two-sphere bundle over H4. So topologically, it's just S2 cross H4. Um, and what's important about it is it has a very special, almost complex structure, which was written down by Eels and Salomon. So that's so Simon Salomon in the 80s. And the correspondence that they used their J4 is the following. So if you have a geomorphic curve in Z, I just have missed a bracket there, you, you can project it back down to H4. And their, their J has the special property that this projected curve is actually an oriented minimal surface. And conversely, there's a way of Gauss lifting a minimal surface back up to recover a geomorphic curve. So what you get is this one-to-one -one correspondence between geomorphic curves in twister space and minimal surfaces in, in H4. There's nothing special about H4 here. This works for any Romanian four manifold. So you, if you haven't seen this sort of thing before, it shouldn't be too surprising when I remind you of the of Weierstrass's theorem. So if you, if you take a minimal surface in R3, you look at its normal, its Gauss map, which is a map to the sphere, and that should be holomorphic if you set the conventions up correctly. That's equivalent to the surface being minimal. So this is like a version of Weierstrass's preparation theorem, but for surfaces in four manifolds. Okay, so now we come to something that really does need hyperbol hyperbolic geometry. So this, this J on Z, so Z is this twister space, a six manifold, two sphere bundle over hyperbolic four space. It has a symplectic form, in fact. So it looks like the product S2 cross H4, but the symplectic form is definitely not a product. It's, it's really quite complicated. I mean, I'll, I'll explain explicitly what it is in a minute. Um, and this form really goes back to, to Weinstein in the 60s. I mean, it wasn't explicitly written in this language, um, but his work on, on fat connections. 
And then it was rediscovered in precisely this context by Reznikov in the 90s. And this symplectic form is compatible with this eels salomon almost complex structure. So now that now we know we really can count the geomorphic curves, you see, because we've got a symplectic form. So, so this minimal surface invariant is just a gromov witten invariant counting geomorphic curves with certain boundary conditions determined by, by the knots. But there's a big but here, and, and, and the but is the following thing. So as you'll, as you'll see later when I, when I explain in more detail what this, how these structures are defined, they, they have poles along the boundary at infinity. So as you move out to infinity in the twister space, um, the J becomes singular, transverse to these fibers, and the omega also becomes singular. And so when you look at what this means for the geomorphic curve equation, it becomes degenerate on the boundary of your Riemann surface. So you have a map from your Riemann surface into the twister space. It sends the boundary of the Riemann surface to the boundary of the twister space. And that's exactly where J is no longer defined. And so if you look at what happens to the symbol, um, it vanishes in certain directions, the directions normal to the curve. See, so it's a, it's a bit of a problem because then you can't just pick up your favorite book on PDE theory and use any of the results. So you can't use the standard elliptic theory for, for, for either the, the Fredholm theory or the compactness theory. See, so you have problems in both the key analytic inputs to uh, geomorphic curve theory. Okay. So it turns out the Fredholm theory is not too difficult and the compactness theory needed a little bit more ingenuity. But anyway, so let's Okay, so supposing we can overcome those problems, what it would lead to is the is the second dream. So the, fir the first dream was remember that this minimal surface invariant should be a not polynomial, a, a known classical not polynomial. And the second dream is that, in fact, this behavior that we see at infinity, this kind of singular behavior on the on the boundary should lead us to be able to define a class of symplectic six manifold, which have infinite volume and you have singularities that are modeled on this situation for hyperbolic twister space so i can define this class i, I won't i probably won't give you the precise definition you'll see it intuitively what the idea is that they they're symplectic six manifolds so that's this x so that's it's a symplectic structure on the interior of a six manifold with boundary the boundary is just the product of a three manifold with the two sphere and the symplectic form becomes singular transverse to the two spheres in a very controlled way, exactly the same way that the symplectic form blows up on this twister space of H4. And if you have this setup, then you should be able to define a gromov witten theory for minimal so for geomorphic curves in this X, um, whose boundaries project to links in the three manifold Y. So and then Okay. Uh, um, just to make sure I understand your, you, what you're going, what you're saying is that the symplectic and complex structures are not genuinely defined on all of the boundary, and therefore, instead of looking at genuine curves with a boundary sort of condition, you look at curves of the interior only with an asymptotic condition, That's going correct. to the boundary, and then you say you can do some analysis to make sure everything still works. Yes. I see. Essentially, essentially, that's right. I mean, that's not exactly how I phrased it. You'll, you'll see later on, I write down the precise definition for the twister space of H4. So what you want is a geomorphic curve in the interior, which extends up to the boundary, but it doesn't make sense to say what geomorphic means on the boundary, because the J isn't defined on the boundary. So you, you need the geomorphic curve condition to hold in the interior, and then you want the boundary, which lies in here, to project down to a fixed link in here. And that then gives a Fred Holm problem. So you, you should be able to count these geomorphic curves to produce invariants of links in Y3 whenever you have an X okay, thank you. that fills this in the right way. Do sense? you have any structure on the boundary? So is there any geometric structure? It's a um, dimensional manifold, so maybe I don't know, contact structure or something. No, no, it's not. It's definitely so. So this is something that I want to, to emphasize. This is a completely different from the things that are already known in the literature. So obviously there's lots of work 
most of it, lots of it by people here in the audience on gelomorphic curves and symplectic manifolds with convex ends, you see, and, and then you can set things up to look kind of formally similar, but it's very different in that there's no, there's seemingly no constraint on the, on the links in Y. They don't have to be, um, you know, it's, it's not like in the convex ends, your gelomorphic curves are forced to limit to, to reeb orbits. You see, so there's, there's no, there's no structure on this Y. I rather meant structure on this two cross Y. Uh, I see. No, again. Well, okay. So <laughs> there is lots in the in the sense that it turns out this is the unit sphere bundle of Y three for some metric, but the curves, which has lots of structure, of course, but the curves themselves have no features at all. So if you take a link in Y three that's oriented, then it lifts to the unit sphere bundle. Yes. Okay, so, so that curve has to is is the, is the potential boundary of your gelomorphic curve in X. But there's no there's no prescription on the curve in Y three itself. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, uh, uh, lift could be in principle remarkable, right? So so uh, lift to, to the unit disk bundle could be the genre or something. I see what you mean. It could be, but it needn't be. <laughs> That's right. I mean, if it were a geodesic in Y three, then that's exactly what would. But, but it's there's no there's no restrictions on the on the links. Okay, so um, I'm obviously not the first person to do anything like this. Uh, let me just mention three three papers or three pieces, three bodies of work which have treated similar questions, um, and I'm I'm sure there are others, but um, th these are the three I've decided to mention. So the the first work is Tommy by Tommy and Tromba who counted minimal surfaces in the three ball, but the Euclidean three ball. So what they wanted to prove was that if you had a loop on the, the surface of the, on, on the two sphere, it was filled by an embedded minimal disk inside the three ball. So the, the solution of the plateau problem tells you there's a minimal disk that fills it, but it might be immersed, it might be branched, it might have horrible singularities. And what they wanted to prove was when the loop is on the three ball, it genuinely fills an embedded minimal disk. And their proof is very similar in spirit to what I'm going to describe today. Then this, this was taken up later by Alex Sackis and Matt Sayo, who counted minimal surfaces in H3. So running out to a collection of circles on the two sphere at infinity in H3. And the, but the, the big difference between these two bodies of work and what I'm describing is that the minimal surfaces in these two papers are hypersurfaces. They're co-dimension one. And minimal surfaces in co-dimension one are very special because they are barriers against themselves. So a minimal surface, if it starts off embedded, it can't come round and touch itself. So as you move the boundary curve, the minimal surface will move, but it won't self-intersect. And similarly, it won't develop a branch point. So you can totally ignore branch points and self-intersections. You can talk throughout the whole game about purely embedded objects. And this is a manifestation of, of something that makes these, these, these situations much simpler. On the other hand, if you have minimal surfaces in a four manifold, then they certainly can become self-intersected or pick up branch points. You just, just need to think of families of complex curves in CP2. You know, take, a, take, your, favorite, take your favorite polynomial um, and it, it'll define probably a smooth curve in CP2. But if you change the coefficients, it could easily become singular. Okay, so the, the other piece of work is to do with gelomorphic curves. So this is paper of Eckholm and Shende, who counted gelomorphic curves in a special symplectic manifold, which is the resolved conifold. So it doesn't matter if you don't know what the resolved conifold is. Probably you do, I don't know. But there's a, it's a special symplectic six manifold, and uh, they were able to take a knot in the three sphere or a link, and out of this link, they produced a Lagrangian in the resolved conifold. And then they use the open gromov witten theory of that Lagrangian, counting gelomorphic curves with Lagrangian boundary conditions. And they proved how to define this count and showed that if you did it right, can assemble the counts correctly, you can recover the Homfly PT polynomial. So this, this was uh, originally conjectured by Aguri and Vaffa with um, inspiration, I guess, from, um, from mirror symmetry and, and string theory. Okay, so why have I chosen to mention that? I mean, there's there's millions of different ways of approaching not polynomials of gelomorphic curves, but this one is particularly close to what I'm talking about for the following reason, which is that this twister space I was talking about is not at all obvious, but in fact it's symplectomorphic to the resolved conifold. 
So it turns out that the resolved conifolds natural symplectic structure, which comes from Kähler geometry, is the same as this other symplectic structure I'm talking about on the twister space of H4. Okay. So there's secretly hidden isometric hyperbolic isometry action on the on the resolved conifold. Okay, so hopefully the minimal surface invariance, which is like a gromov witten invariant of this twister space, should lead to homofly PT as well. Okay, but there's a big difference between the two setups. So Eckholm and Shende, they have Lagrangian boundary conditions. You see, whereas in our situation, the boundary conditions are not at all the same. Okay, so the, the curves run out to infinity. Okay, so now, now um, that's the introduction over, and now I'm going to tell you what a twister space is, if you haven't seen this before. Um, so there's, there's a huge body of theory on twister spaces, and I'm going to have to be quite brief, otherwise we won't, we won't get back to the geomorphic curves. So the, the game starts with an oriented Riemannian 4-manifold, and I'm going to define a fibre bundle over this M4, whose fibres are all two spheres. So the fiber at a point P, so P is a point in M, and the fiber over P is the following thing. So I look at all of the linear complex structures on the tangent space, which are orthogonal for the metric. And also, if you have such a J, it gives you an orientation, turns this into a copy of C2, which is oriented. And I want that to agree with the original orientation I chose. Okay. So the, the space of such things is you know, obviously SO4 is going to act on it. In fact, the action is transitive. The stabilizer is U2. And if you stare at that for long enough, you see it's the, it's the two-sphere. So this is a two-sphere bundle. Over each point in M, I have the two-sphere of Js at that tangent space, which are compatible with the metric and the orientation. And if I fit all those two spheres together, I get the twister space of M. Okay? So now I want to tell you how to write down an almost complex structure on this twister space. And the idea is the following. So, so I, Z is a point in my, tang, in, in my twister space. And I look at the tangent space to Z and it splits into two pieces. So let, let me name this projection Pi. So there's the vertical tangent space, which is tangent to the fibers of this Pi. And then I can find a complement to the vertical tangent space, the horizontal distribution, which is just the levi shiverter connection of the, hyper, of, the, of the metric on M4. See, the metric has a, has a levi shiverter connection, and so I can compare nearby tangent spaces, and so I can compare nearby twister fibers. See, so that, that gives me this H. So now the, the J that I'm going to write down is going to make both of these complex subspaces, and so now I just need to tell you what J does on each space. Okay. So let me start with H. Okay? So this, this horizontal space is isomorphic to the tangent space downstairs. That's the whole point of the complement. See, the projection map makes the horizontal space isomorphic to the tangent space downstairs. And this point Z is a J on the tangent space downstairs. Okay, so on H, I have a tautological choice of J. That's this guy here. Okay? And as I move up and down the fiber, this J will change. All of these horizontal spaces look like the tangent space downstairs, but as complex vector spaces, they're all changing. I'm seeing a whole two sphere worth of different J's. Meanwhile, on the vertical tangent space, these vertical tangent spaces are just the tangent spaces to round two spheres, you see? So I know how to multiply by I on those guys, and I'm gonna call that JV. So I can put them together to get JV plus JZ. That's one possibility. But this JV, I had two choices. I could either take plus or minus. See, if I change both by a sign, that doesn't change anything at all. My geomorphic curves are still the same thing. But if I change one summoned by a sign, I'll get a genuinely different, almost complex structure. Okay. So there are these two possibilities depending on the, orient the, the sign I pick on the sphere. And we call one J plus and the other one J minus. And in this talk, we're going to use J minus. So if you if you go back to this theorem that I told you about by Weierstrass, if you take a, take a, take a certain minimal surface in R3 
and you look at its Gauss map to the sphere, if you use the standard orientation conditions, minimality is equivalent to that map being anti-holomorphic. And it's that word anti, which is why we take a minus here. <laughs> okay, it's, the, it's the, exactly the same feature. On the other hand, J plus is the one that people normally use in twister theory. This is the one that's the twister theory of Penrose and Atiyah, Hitchin and Singer. And I, I'm going to say absolutely nothing about this except for one word, which is integrability. So th this J minus is never integrable, whereas this J plus can be. So people wanted to study four dimensional Riemannian geometry using complex geometry. So they were interested in, in J plus because it could be integrable and then they could use holomorphic techniques. If you're interested in minimal surfaces, it's J minus that you have to study. Okay, so from now on, I'm just going to write J for J minus. Okay. So now what about this symplectic form? So there's a natural metric on this tangent space because the vertical tangent spaces are tangent spaces to round spheres. So I know how to take in a products. And I declare that to be an orthogonal sum. And then the horizontal subspaces are all the same as the metric. They're all isomorphic to the tangent space downstairs where I already have a metric, you see? So this guy has a natural metric. And so I can turn my J using this natural metric into an omega. Okay. And now I can ask, is that closed? It seems like a, a lot to ask for. And the miracle is that it's closed for H4. It genuinely is closed on the nodes. Okay. So we have this. This is this is where we really do have to use hyperbolic geometry. Okay, so we have a symplectic manifold with an almost complex structure which sees the minimal surfaces. So I want to explain about the seeing the minimal surfaces now. So what's the analogue of the Gauss lift? So the, the, the Gauss map in R3 just sends a point on a surface to its normal vector. So the, normally the Gauss lift would take values in oriented two planes inside the tangent bundle, and that's not quite what we've got. So let me explain how this goes. So suppose I take a tangent space downstairs in my four manifold, and I take a two dimensional plane inside that tangent space. So it's a, it's a lemma that there's a unique J in my twister fiber a unique point for which the corresponding co almost complex structure on this real four dimensional space makes P a complex line. Okay, once I know what J does here, then I know that it must preserve the, the orthogonal complement of P. See, and if P is oriented and J is, preserves the orientation, then it must also act the right way on the orthogonal complement for the orientations to match up. So the J is uniquely determined once I know that it makes P a complex line. And so if I have an immersion into the four manifold, the tangent spaces lift it automatically to Z. And that's more or less half a Gauss lift, but it's exactly what we need. Okay, so here's, here's the theorem of Eels and Salomon. So let's start off with a geomorphic curve. So here's my notation for a Riemann surface, it's sigma with a little j. I send the Riemann surface into the twister space. If it's a J holomorphic, then when I project downstairs, the map that I get by projecting is conformal and harmonic, which implies its image is a, is a minimal surface. Okay. So I've, I've found a conformal parameterization of a minimal surface. Conversely, if I start with a conformal parameterization of a minimal surface, then its Gauss lift is geomorphic. So this is this is the analog of Weierstrass's theorem in R3. And if you do this, you get a one-to-one -one correspondence between the geomorphic curves in Z, but you have to you have to rule out the fibers. You see these two spheres are automatically geomorphic curves and they project downstairs to points. We don't want to count points as minimal surfaces. So ignoring the vertical geomorphic curves, we get um, a one-to-one -one correspondence between geomorphic curves and these conformally parameterized minimal surfaces. Okay, so now let me explain how to use this game to produce an invariant of a link by counting minimal surfaces. So just, just a bit of notation now. So whenever I write X with a bar over the top, I'm gonna mean a compact manifold with boundary and when I write it without the bar, I mean the interior, okay? This is gonna have the unfortunate consequence that I'm gonna be writing sigma bar 
when I, I, I mean there the Riemann surface with boundary, I don't mean the Riemann surface with the opposite complex structure. But the, this notation is standard in texts on analysis on manifolds of boundary. So that's just the way life is. Okay, so H4 bar, what is it? It's the closed four ball. And Z bar, that's the twister space of the closed four ball. It's the, it's the twister space of H4 with this two sphere bundle added on on the boundary. It's the same thing diffeomorphically as S2 times the closed four ball. And my Riemann surface is going to be the underlying topological surface is called sigma bar. It's a compact surface with boundary who's got C components. The boundary is not empty. And I'm going to ask that its genus be G. OK, and now I'm going to tell you exactly what sort of geomorphic curves I can. Okay, so. So in the genus here, is the genus of the thing or the double? Uh, if you cap off each boundary component with a disk, you get a closed Riemann surface, and that's the genus. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Which you can also compute from the genus of the double if you're if you're courageous. Probably not live in a talk. Okay, so the, the admissible geomorphic curves are what? So I'm going to take a pair of objects, U and J. So J is going to be a Riemann surface structure on the on sigma, and U is going to be a map. So I want them. First of all, let's just talk about the map. So I want I want the map. From the Riemann surface with boundary, from sigma bar to the, the closure of the twister space. So these are just manifolds. So I, I can just I ask for this map to be C1 alpha. Okay. And I want the projection downstairs to H4 bar to be C2 alpha. Secretly, I know this is going to be the Gauss lift of that. So that's why I want this to start off as C1 alpha and the boundary to be C2 alpha. The, the projection C2 alpha. And I want on the boundary downstairs, I want to be an embedding. Okay, because that's going to be my, the image of this is going to be my link. And now I want the geomorphic curve to meet infinity transversely. Okay, so I don't want any other part of the Riemann surface to come and touch the boundary. And I want the intersection between the image of the Riemann surface, the image of sigma and the boundary to just be this transverse intersection uh, in this link, which will be C to alpha because of this condition. And I'm going to call that link the boundary of U. Okay. And now I want to impose the, the holomorphic condition. So this J, if you remember that in the definition that there was a pair UJ, and I want the J to be a Riemann surface structure on sigma bar. And U over the interior should be holomorphic map. Okay. So notice holomorphic, that means U is automatically smooth on the interior. So it's a bit weird that I maybe that I started off with these conditions here. But it's smooth on the interior, but it needn't be smooth up to the boundary because the geomorphic curve equation doesn't make sense on the boundary. See? And in fact, you can find examples where it's only continuous up to the boundary. So. We really do want, and it some, sometimes in, in, in these sorts of games, you could just take CK alpha for any K. C2 alpha, I think, is the minimal, minimal regularity. And maybe if there's time later on, I'll explain why two is so special. Okay. Below two, I, it's not possible to get good control and infinity anymore. Anyway, that's, that's what we're doing. So we're studying these geomorphic curves, which are C2 up to the boundary. They meet the boundary uh, transversely. In, in these embedded links. Okay, so I just want to emphasize that this J does not extend to the closure of um, the twister space, it doesn't extend up to the boundary. And so the geomorphic curve equation doesn't literally doesn't make sense on the boundary. Okay, so now what's the moduli space of geomorphic curves? Well, we just take these, um, these admissible geomorphic curves and we also divide out by diffeomorphisms of the domain. So there's an, there's an obvious way for diffeomorphisms to act both on J and, and the map such that it preserves the condition of geomorphicity. And so I just divide out by the whole diffeomorphism group. And then he, here's the theorem, or at least the first theorem. So this moduli space of geomorphic curves, it's an infinite dimensional Banach manifold. Okay? And you can send a geomorphic curve to its boundary, by which I mean I take the map, take, take a map U that represents this equivalence class, take the image of the boundary projected down via the twister projection into the three sphere at infinity. That's a C2 alpha link in S3. 
Okay, so I have this map from geomorphic curves to links. So it's a map between two infinite dimensional Banach manifolds. And it turns out this map is Fredholm and has index zero. So this is good news because it means I can try and count geomorphic curves with a given boundary. See, so the index is zero. So they, they ought, to, they, they ought to, to come in a discrete set. So I'm not going to say anything about the proof of this theorem at all, other than the, the following few words. So the, as I've already stressed, the, 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 there's a problem, which is that the linearization of this equation is not elliptic. It, it's not uniformly elliptic. The symbol degenerates on the boundary. So you can't just open up Gilbarg and Trudinger and, and start using theorems from, from analysis of elliptic boundary value problems, you see? It's, it's not even like Lagrangian boundary conditions for geomorphic curves with boundary. It's more complicated. But fortunately, there is a big body of work on these degenerate equations due to Matt Sayer, Rafe Matt Sayer, and Richard Melrose. So if you work hard enough looking at their, their uh, theory, you can pull together the pieces you need to, to prove these Fred Holm results. And the payoff is that this, this boundary condition prescribing the link in S3 is a genuine Fred Holm boundary condition. And it seems to me to be completely different from the ones that already exist in the literature for geomorphic curves. You see, it's, it's nothing like a Lagrangian boundary condition or the condition that a uh, punctured Riemann surface, the puncture gets wrapped around a, a Reeb orbit or, or things like this, you see? I don't, I don't know if that's... The, the boundary lies on a five manifold and I've prescribed exactly three coordinates of it by projecting away the two sphere. So. But like technically, when you say the index is zero, it tells you the dimension is the expected dimension is zero. But that's right. You're also saying there is a compactness statement. No, not yet. I'm coming to that. So you don't a priori know it's discrete. In in this theorem, right? I see what you mean. Yeah, you you hope that it's a finite number of points. Okay, that's right. You hope the theorem that I've proved is exactly what I've stated. Okay, and now what you were alluding to. So if we if we count geomorphic disks, so the genus is zero and the number of components on the boundary is one, then this really is proper. This map is is proper. So the pre-image of a point is a compact set. So the pre-image of a regular value is a finite set. So this, the second part of this theorem, which I, I'm definitely not going to talk about at all, is that there's a consistent way to orient the fibers. So the, the way you orient the fibers is the same way you always orient the fibers in geomorphic curve theory. So let, let's not worry about that. And so that means that you can take a signed count of the number of points in a regular fiber, and that number won't depend upon the regular value you chose, and it gives you your gromov witten invariant. Yeah. So there is a knot invariant which counts minimal disks in H4 that fill the knot. So one of the things that you're used to with geomorphic curves is you need an energy bound. So the standard way to get the energy bound in the compact case is you just use the fact that it's homological. The total energy of a, of a geomorphic curve is given by the integral of omega over the, over the, over the image. In this situation, there's a massive simplification, which is the following. So this D, we're counting minimal disks. It has a natural hyperbolic metric itself. See, that's complete and an infinite volume. And if I use this hyperbolic metric, then there's a very simple Bochner argument that proves that the energy density of U is automatically bounded. Okay. It's not just the total energy, the energy density. I mean, the total energy is infinite because the volume of D is now infinite, but the, the energy density is bounded. So there can't be any bubbles at all, okay? So it might look immediately to you from, from now, it might look that the properness theorem is trivial, but it's not at all because the map isn't a map between compact manifolds, you see? So, so there's, there's two problems. First of all, uniform bound on energy density, you'd normally just then want to crank that up to bounds for all the derivatives using Schauder theory or something like that. But, but you can't do that here because the PDE is not uniformly elliptic. So any attempt you get to bootstrap to get higher and higher estimates, the constants disappear. They, it, you know, the control evaporates as you run to the boundary because the symbol de degenerates. 
And the other, the other problem is that you need to control physically where the map is, you see, because, because maps into non-compact spaces can just disappear off to infinity. Anyway, you can't use the standard methods to bootstrap energy density bound to higher order control. And so the solution is to use geometric and analytic properties, not of the geomorphic curve equation itself, but actually of minimal surfaces in H4. So that's how the proof goes. So maybe I'll say more about that later, depending on how I do for time. Okay, so the, the bad news is that if you look at what happens in general, so now here I'm talking about genus G minimal surfaces with C boundary components mapping down to C component links. This map is not proper in general. Okay. So this is this is the obstacle that, that one needs to overcome. So I want to give you a concrete example, well, more or less, I'll explain an example of the failure of this properness. And that's some some beautiful minimal surfaces found by by Teen and Gaia. Okay, so here's the setup. So I take H4, and inside H4, there are lots of totally geodesic copies of H2. Okay, so let's take a pair that meet at the origin, orthogonally. Let's call them H1, 2, and H2, 2. Okay, so they kind of meet like this. And their boundary is a pair of circles in the three sphere. And the fact that these, um, these two H2s meet transversely in a single point tells you that these two boundary circles are linked once. And what you've got is the hop flink. Okay. So we have the, we have the hop flink in S3. And it's filled by a pair of minimal disks that intersect. So here, here's what Teen was able to prove. So this pair of minimal disks is the only minimal surface which fills the standard hop flink. Yeah. However, he then found a two-dimensional family of perturbations of this hop flink, HT, depending on a two, two real parameters. And for each of these deformed guys, so when T is not zero, when I'm not the standard hop flink, he found a minimal annulus, AT, that fills in HT. Okay. So what's happening is you take this HT, which is very close to the hop flink, and it's filled by an annulus. And as you move AT back to the hop flink, the minimal annulus, its waist shrinks and pinches off, and the waist pinches off and the limits this pair of discs. Okay. Can I think of that as just the fibers of the luscious vibration on B4? uh with a single fiber a unique one well it's it's analogous to that I, I i don't know that these at give a nice vibration of b4 okay i'm not i'm not sure that I mean, it's, what you should be thinking of is this looks a lot like the standard Lefschetz vibration ZW equals, sorry, ZW equals T. So as I move T in the complex line, I now get a, le a Lefschetz vibration. I can intersect this with the four ball if I like. And these would all be minimal surfaces in, in R4, you see? And they'd be cylinders apart from when T equals zero when you'd have a pair of planes. So it's, it's analogous, it's completely analogous to that. You're right. So here's a picture of the minimal annulus with its waist that's shrinking down to a point. So this would be bad news if we wanted to just count annuli, you see, because we'd have an annulus AT, and then as we move the link, we take a sequence of links that converges to H0. We have a sequence of annuli, but it's got nowhere to go because there's nothing that fills H0 besides this pair of disks. And indeed, the annulus does converge down to this pair of disks. So properness fails. But look very carefully. It's a two dimensional family of perturbations of H zero. So away from the origin in R two, properness still holds. Okay, and that that two is crucial. See, my hope is that properness holds away from a bad set of co dimension two. 
So let me let me try and explain this. Expectation. There exists a set of bad links where properness will fail. This set should be co-dimensioned too, but the, the map should be the boundary map should be proper over the complement of this co-dimension too. Okay. So why does that mean that we win? So if this were true, then we could define the minimal surface invariant exactly as before. So we, cho we choose a regular value of our boundary map that isn't a bad link. Okay. Then we count, take the sign count of the number of points in its pre-image. And the claim is that that's actually a not invariant. So how, how do we see that? Suppose we had another regular value that was a good link. And uh, that these two links, k and k hat, there's an isotopy between them, kt. Now, no, nothing says that this isotopy has to be made up of regular values. Nothing says that this isotopy has to be made up of good links. But because the space of bad links is co-dimension two, I can perturb this isotopy so that it misses all the bad links. See? And I can also perturb it so that it's transverse to the boundary map. That's the standard game in Fred Holm differential topology. And so then the pre-image of this isotopy is a compact oriented cobordism. So it's, it's a smooth cobordism because this guy is transverse to B and it's compact because I've avoided all the bad links. And the, the orientation comes from the story that I've suppressed about how to orient the fibers. And so a compact oriented cobordism of dimension one, because B has got index zero and I've added in one parameter, that, that means that I'm going to have a equivalent, the, the counts, the sign counts of the boundary are equal. Okay, so now I need to explain to you why these bad links should be co-dimension two. Okay. So now let, let me explain what, what happens. Um, so we, we're going to start with a sequence of gelomorphic curves. So the map's changing and the complex structure on the Riemann surface is changing. Okay. And their boundary links inside the three sphere are converging in C2 to a link K. Okay. And what we want to do is we want to understand when, we, when can we extract a subsequence of these gelomorphic curves. So the first thing to say is that if the JN converge modulo diffeomorphisms to a, to a nice Riemann surface structure on sigma bar, if we stay away from the boundary of the deline mumford space of sigma bar, then in fact the maps also converge. So the, the proof of this is identical to the proof that worked for disks. So for, for disks, the JN are equal modulo diffeomorphisms. So the, the only time you can have problems is when the JN don't converge, when the JN have a, a nodal limit. So I've attempted to draw a nodal limit here. So th this is just the domain. I'm not talking about the map yet. OK, so here the domain sigma, sigma JN converges in the sense of Delina Mumford to this nodal Riemann surface. So there's a curve that's been pinched to a point. OK. So one thing that you might worry about is what happens if this node isn't in the interior, but it's actually on the boundary somewhere. So here are two pictures of boundary nodes. So in the Deline Mumford compactification, this limit certainly exists, as, as does this one. But you can prove that the existence of the maps UN prohibit this kind of degeneration in the domain. Okay, so that's, a, that's also a theorem. If these Riemann surfaces, these gelomorphic curves have boundaries that converge, then the domains cannot exhibit this behavior. The node has to be in the interior. Okay, so now there are three possibilities for what happens to the map. So the map's UN. The first, so there's two cases, and case one I've split into two parts. So, Case one is when you have this nodal Riemann surface, this sigma infinity. So this sigma infinity could, for example, be this Riemann surface here. OK, any Riemann, any nodal Riemann surface that can appear in the Deline-Mumford compactification of the original domain 
and that doesn't have any nodes on the boundary. Okay, that's sigma infinity. So the first possibility is that the maps converge to a geomorphic map from this nodal Riemann surface. Okay. So now there are two different things that can happen. The first thing that can happen is that, so here I've drawn a limiting Riemann surface. So the original Riemann surface was like this, this surface of genus one with two legs. Okay. And what's happened is that we've pinched here and here. So you can, you can pick your favorite curves. Here's one that's pinched to zero and here's another that's, oh no, hang on, I've done that. It's slightly more complicated because this guy is, right, so th this curve here is pinched off and then something here is pinched off. Anyway, you, could, you can try and find the curves yourself. I'm struggling to do it. So anyway, here's a Riemann surface. And what's happened is it's got irreducible components. Two of them have boundary and one of them has no boundary. Okay. So case one, A, is when the irreducible components with either they all have boundary or if there's one of these guys that has no boundary, then my map U infinity is constant on that. It's a ghost, a ghost component. Okay. So that, that's what I've drawn here. Here's the domain and U infinity has just sent this to a, to a point. Yeah. Okay. So what I can prove is that in this case, the problem happens in co-dimension two in the following sense. So, so let, let's write K in, K infinity is the limit of these, these links. And that's the limit. That's the boundary of this, in, of this limiting map. So what we want to do is we want to understand what links fill curves that look like this, where every irreducible component has a boundary. Okay. So this is co-dimension two. And the reason is intuitively, if you take a pair of surfaces inside a six manifold and ask for them to intersect, two, you've got two dimensions on this surface, two dimensions on this surface, the ambient space is six dimensional. So it's a co-dimension two phenomenon that they should intersect. See? What, what do you need to make that precise? You need to know that the space of surfaces that you have, that you're considering, is sufficiently transverse that that intuitive argument is actually rigorous. So the, the way to do that is to talk about evaluation maps. So if you've seen how to do this with evaluation maps, then what I'll say will convince you it's true. And if you haven't, then um, maybe you should just be content with the intuitive reasoning I just gave. Two surfaces of dimension two inside a six manifold, they, they, they miss two dimensions. So there's a co-dimension two phenomenon that they should touch. Okay, so, so what's the evaluation map? So this is a moduli space of Riemann surf of, of geomorphic curves. So there's like a universal curve. So that's the moduli space of geomorphic curves with one marked point. Okay. So the fiber over a, a, the equivalence class of U or J is just biomorphic to the Riemann surface. So there's an important point here. I'm only considering the interior points for my universal curve. Okay. And evaluating U at a point of sigma gives me a map from the universal curve into Z. It's kind of the, the tautological, it's the universal map. <laughs> It's the evaluation map. Okay? And the theorem is that this evaluation map from an infinite dimensional manifold to Z is a submersion. And once you know that, that's enough to tell you that whatever is true in terms of co-dimension for arbitrary submanifolds, it's also true for, for our geomorphic curves. We've simply got so many geomorphic curves that the transversality arguments are all okay because the evaluation map is a submersion. Okay, case 1b. So in case 1b, so case 1, remember the maps converge to a limit on the nodal Riemann surface. Okay? We can have a problem if there's a closed component of the domain here on which u infinity is non-constant. So the, the image of this closed component must be a closed geomorphic curve in Z. 
which means it must be a fiber. The reason it must be a fiber is because it projects down to either a point, if it's a fiber, or a minimal surface, if it's not. But there are no compact minimal surfaces in H4 by, by lots of reasons. You bring in a copy of, bring in a barrier, copy of H3 from infinity till it touches it, then you'll have a contradiction from the maximum principle. So what's happening is U infinity is sending this portion of the minimal surface of the Riemann surface out to a decent geomorphic curve of the type that we like. But it's sending this part I mean, in the picture that I've drawn, it's a it's a cover of an elliptic curve covering a CP1. See, and that, that's not nice. So I'll explain why that's not nice in a minute. So case two is very similar, but in case two, so this is everything else that can possibly happen. If the UNs don't converge to U infinity defined on the whole of the modal Riemann surface, the reason is that a bubble has appeared. Okay. And if a bubble appears, it can only appear at a node. So this is something that's particular to this situation. And it's because we have this uniform energy density bound that I mentioned earlier. Okay. So the only bubbles can appear in the nodes. So here's something that can happen. So you, you, your sigma infinity has two, two components. In this drawing, the two components of sigma infinity are a disk. Okay. So in sigma infinity, these guys meet in a point. But when I take the limit of the map, the derivative blows up at that point. And so to get a domain that's well defined for my map, I have to do the, re the whole rescaling bubbling argument of beloved of geomorphic curve theory. And I'll produce an extra component inside the domain of the map, which is this S2. And this S2 will be mapped by my U infinity to a twister fiber like this. Okay. So in both pictures, when a compact component was sent to a twister fiber or where a bubble appeared, the problem is that the Riemann surfaces, the geomorphic curves that I'm getting, their images intersect, but via these two spheres. Okay. So let's see morally why that shouldn't be a problem. We want to rule out the links which are filled by disconnected geomorphic curves who are joined by a finite number of fibers. And morally, this is co-dimension two also for the following reason. The index of a fiber is zero. Okay, so if you just compute the virtual dimension of the moduli space of geomorphic curves in the homology class of the fiber, you get zero. And so morally speaking, these fibers should be exactly like the other minimal surfaces we were counting. It should be a discrete, maybe even a finite number of them if you if you could prove some compactness theorem. So, so when you have one of them, you, the condition that your other surfaces touch it is co-dimension two for each intersection point that you have. See, so this picture of the elliptic curve mapping down to the CP1, that should occur in co-dimension two in the space of knots. Similarly, when I have these two disks that are joined by a single fiber, that should be co-dimension four because I've got two intersection points. So each one drops the co-dimension by two. So morally, we should be able to just ignore the links that fill that are filled by those configurations. However, although the evaluation map is transverse for moduli space of geomorphic curves that run out to infinity, it's definitely not for these fibers. And the reason is that the fibers come in a four dimensional family, but the index is zero. So the fibers shouldn't exist but they do, okay? So the bad configurations are generic, you see? If I take any, any version of the hop link, it will be filled by two minimal disks. And in, these minimal disks touch in H4. In twister space, their lifts are separated. But if I include the fiber between them, I get one of these bad configurations. So whatever version of the hop flink I take, it's filled by a bad configuration. But the configuration is only really bad if it arises as the limit of something. And this bad configuration, it can't be smoothed out precisely because the fiber is obstructed. 
And the fiber is obstructed because it moves in a four-dimensional family. So morally, everything should be okay. These bad configurations should also occur in co-dimension two. Now, of course, the grown-up way to prove that is just to perturb J. So if you perturb J slightly, then all the fibers, they all disappear apart from a finite number. And then the whole argument works. So if we perturb J, we'd have a discrete family of these compact curves, and we can do this keeping the same asymptotics of J. So all the Fredholm theory just goes through. So that, that would actually prove the theorem apart from one problem, which is that the compactness arguments near infinity genuinely rely on the shape of J because they used, as I said, the, the theory of minimal surfaces in H4. So that's, that's what I'm looking at at the moment, how, how exactly to perturb the J in order to get rid of this four dimensional family of fibers in such a way that I can just modify lightly the compactness arguments at infinity. And hopefully when that's done, then the theorem will be true for all, for all different types of Riemann surface and not just disks. Okay, so if my watch is correct, I think I've, I've hit my hour and that's probably a good place to stop. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have uh, time for some questions. Uh, are there any questions uh, for Joel from the audience? Um. Yeah, maybe I have a, I have a question. So uh, maybe two questions actually. So you already get some invariant by counting the disks, if I understand. No? Mm -hmm. So what what is this invariant? That's one question. It's very hard to compute. That's the problem. <laughs> so the the only case I can compute it for is the unknot. So, uh -huh. so if you if you just take a great circle, then it's filled by a unique minimal surface, which is the totally geodesic copy of H two. So the answer is one. So the, the corollary of that is no matter how wiggly your unknot is, it must be filled by at least one minimal disk. Um, but of course, your question was really about other knots. I suspect. Um, so I, I don't know. So the, no, the because you, you 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 said that you thought that this would be identified to something in the home fly uh, polynomial. So this right. should, this should so, already be do this should already be be something for for the disk. That's true. That's but, true. The problem is that because I don't have a completely solid definition of all of the other genus invariants, then I don't know exactly how to combine them all. So it might, it might be right. No, I, I mean, I, I, I certainly don't have an answer about that. My other question was from what you did already, wouldn't it result that if you look at the curves of G, minimal surfaces of genus less than G, then you get something which is invariant, not, not, not fixing the genus, but putting an upper bound on the genus. Don't, don't, don't you decrease the genus? at each uh, bad step somehow, even, even <laughs> forgetting that it would be co-dimension two somehow. But... Right, so the, 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 the problem I think is sometimes you'll want to count the same surface more than once, but you don't know that a priori. So if you look at the standard Hopflink, it should morally be filled by a pair of disks and an annulus and there's a miracle well, a, a bad co coincidence which is that the annulus that it's filled by is that is the pair of discs so if you try and count surfaces of, of that? But that, that's quite reasonable to have an algebraic count which does not coincide with the with the geometrical count somehow right but i what i don't know is how to how to hardwire in that i've that I've counted that surface, or that I should count that surface twice. So I can, I can certainly count all the surfaces I can see, but then if they appeared also as the generations of other surfaces, then I should count them again. No, you could say that they, they appear with multiplicity in a way, no? Exactly. Right, right. But how, I, don't, I don't know how to define the multiplicity other than... So I think maybe this, this could maybe relate to Ekholm's initial approach with dumping chains, because they are sort of designed to tell you 
which configurations come from the generations and then you sort of know how to count them but i don't know how applicable that would be oh, in okay. in this setting that, that's something i should look at then mm -hmm. but, but but perhaps claude was suggesting something even more straightforward maybe so if i take take a knot that's filled by a surface of genus one it might when I perturb the knot, the genus one surface might become a disc with two points identified. See, so for a bad knot, so I expect the knot to be filled by a disc and also by a disc with two points identified or a surface of genus one. But what if the disc and the disc with two points identified were the same disc? Then when I was counting for that particular knot, I wouldn't know what the multiplicity was. Does, it, does, that, make, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Also, I, I, I missed that, but all your all your curves a priori are, are counted uh, with a plus one. You don't have plus one. No, no, no. There was a sign. There was a, there was a sign. But there I is a sign anyway. Yeah, it, with the sign is defined in exactly the same way as you define the sign. As for holomorphic curves. Okay. Yeah, curves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay so you, you already have a sign. So yeah, that's right. Having multiplicity doesn't. I mean, it's no, it's, it's surprising. It, right. So the multiplicity occurs when the Right. What 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 I'm unable to do is work out what the multiplicity should be, because so this this example I was talking to you, the hypothetical example. You take a you take a knot that's bounded by a Riemann surface by by a geomorphic curve of genus uh -huh. one, and as you move the knot, that geomorphic curve pinches and it becomes a disc with two points identified. Yes. At the same time, that Riemann, that knot or, or it might be filled by a disc. And as you move the knot, the disc and the Riemann surface with genus one yeah. become the same thing in the limit. So how do I see in the limit that that guy should be counted twice and not just once? But this should be something local on the on the minimal surface that, that you can see just by looking at an infinite, infinitesimal neighborhood of your minimal surface, because... Uh, yes, no? That's yeah, 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 I agree, I agree. There, there ought to be... So it should be the computation of some uh, number coming from a linearized operator or something like that. I mean, the, the, I don't mean that if you show me one, I can I can give you the number, but in theory... There's no, I understand a, what you mean. I understand what you mean. Theoretically, yeah, yeah. there's a recipe to... There should be a recipe to, to count the multiplicity. Right, which, which sees the fact that there's a way of smoothing this. Yes, that's... I mean, that's what I would expect. Okay, I... I I don't want to tie you up. Sorry. But that was a very, it's a very, very interesting observation. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it like that. I just saw that I might end up in a situation where one minimum, one, one geomorphic curve should be counted twice, but I wouldn't know how to. In another situation, it should only be counted once. But okay, that's yeah, that's definitely worth thinking about. Thank you. No, oh, thanks to you. It was great talk, by the way. Thank you. Thank you very much. And what happens if you not have the singularity? Can you like crossing? Can you can you mm, extend the invariant? Yeah, that's a very deep question. So imagine that we had the not invariant for all of the all of the surfaces, all of the genus, all of the genera that we wanted. If you want to compute it, that what you want to do is exactly what you're asking. So you yeah. want to see what happens to the invariant as you push one strand of the knot through the other. Mm -hmm. And so it should satisfy a skein relation if you combine all of the terms correctly. And yeah, so this is something I've been thinking about a lot and I haven't reached any 100% concrete conclusions. But it, it looks to me that if you take the three things in the skein, there's one like this, there's one, there's, sorry, there's one like this, there's one like this, and there's one like that. Did that make sense? So the, there's the crossing on one side. There's what happens if you resolve the crossing and there's the crossing on the other side. And my conjecture is that you can only have minimal surfaces that fill two of those three. Mm -hmm. So do you have a minimal surface that fills this guy and you run in, you can see. So one thing that could happen is one sheet could just pass through like this. Imagine you took two, two minimal disks that fill knots and you just push one knot through the other. There's no reason why those minimal disks shouldn't exist on both sides. On the other hand, 
One thing that can happen is that as you push into the singularity, the minimal surface pinches and develops a node at infinity, and then it stops to exist on the other side, and instead it pings out into the resolution. So proving that with the right signs would prove the scan relation. So it's if, if you take into account these, so when you go from here to here, you change the, the self-linking number. And, and, and from here to here, you change the twistorial self-linking number as well. So if you take that into account and you take into account the Euler characteristic of the surface you get from here to here in the right way, then you can see that, the, the, that roughly speaking, you should be getting the Homfly skein relation. But, but you still need to prove this difficult fact that if the surface pinches a node here, then it doesn't just extend onto the other side, it in fact opens this way. Does, does this change the, sorry, does this change the genus when you it, do Yes, it? yeah, yeah, it could definitely change the genus, yeah. Okay. I mean, it could, it could even take a, a connected surface to a disconnected one. So the, the, when, you, when you package things up, you, you probably don't want to use genus, you probably want to use Euler characteristic and you want to count not necessarily connected fillings. So that's exactly what happens in Eckholm and Schender. So, I mean, if, if yeah, if one stares at the, the, the formulae long enough, one's convinced that probably the same story is the same results are true that Eckholm and Schender have been able to prove. But it becomes a relatively difficult question about minimal surfaces in H four. <laughs> Uh, are there other uh, are there questions? Maybe just uh, to to go back to the specificity of H four. You mentioned it's because you need hyperbolicity to make sure you get an actually symplectic form. That's right. So until now, I'd barely mentioned the symplectic form at all. So normally in symplectic geometry, you use the symplectic form to get a total energy bound, but we have a local energy bound. Because yeah. and that and that only needed the fact that H four was asymptotically hyperbolic is negatively curved. Sorry. On the other hand, if you perturb the J, then you probably will need to use the fact that you're tamed by this symplectic form to control energy somehow. So I, mean, I could say I could say a lot more about that, but but perhaps there's there's no time. So that that's why H four is important. the The other thing that's very important about H four is the exact way in which the metric becomes singular at infinity tells you the exact way that this J becomes singular at infinity, which tells you the exact way that the equation degenerates, which is really important for all the Fredholm theory that I kind of slightly glossed over. the The idea is that so if you look at elliptic operators on a compact manifold, you zoom in on a point and very, very near to a point, they basically look like a constant coefficient operator. So if you can answer the problems for a constant coefficient operator, you can answer the problems for elliptic operator and compact manifold up to finite discrepancy, which is why they become Fred Holm. In this game, if you zoom in at a point on the boundary, you don't see a constant coefficient operator. Instead, you see a, a kind of homothetically invariant operator on a hyperbolic space. So that becomes your local model. And, and the local model that you see is the, is the one that you get precisely because the geometry is hyperbolic at infinity. If you chose a different space, for example, the complex hyperbolic plane, we could play this whole game with a complex hyperbolic plane. By a miracle, its twister space is also symplectic. So you could count minimal surfaces in the complex hyperbolic plane. And now you could ask what, what happens to this problem at infinity? So I have a PhD student looking at this, and what it seems is that the Fredholm behavior then is very well behaved precisely when the minimal surface meets the boundary in a Legendrian knot. So the, the, the reason is that if you run to infinity in the complex hyperbolic plane, the metric blows up, but it blows up at different rates in the contact distribution and in the red direction. The two direction, the two rates blow up differently. And it blows up at exactly the right rate tangent to the contact distribution to mean that the Fredholm theory works well when the boundary of the minimal surface is Legendrian. I mean, we're used to looking at geomorphic curves inside the complex hyperbolic plane whose boundaries are not Legendrian, of course. They're the, they're the wrong sort of minimal surface. 
The right minimal surfaces for this game ought to be the geomorphic curves upstairs that project to minimal surfaces with Legendrian boundary. But that that's all very much work in progress. So thank you. You're welcome. Chris, I, I have also one uh, maybe last uh, question uh, about these uh, bad situations one yes. and two, and and the closed case, right? So 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 in principle, one can take H four right. mod by some discrete group, yes, right, and, and have a closed case, and it's, it's it's not as nice as you know having the same thing with dimension six. I think maybe maybe Johnny Evans thought about this at some point. That's right. So, so what you're talking about is if I take a compact hyperbolic four manifold, I can look at its twister space. It's a symplectic manifold, and I can ask what are its gromov witten invariants. So, morally speaking, the gromov witten invariants ought to count minimal surfaces in the hyperbolic four manifold. But of course, then you just run into the, the standard collection of problems that people have worked out how to solve for computing gromov witten invariants of an arbitrary symplectic six manifold. Yes. Does, does that make sense? Yes, yes, and I'm somehow wondering if, if, if these cases 1, 2, and B appear there somehow already, and, and then maybe... Absolutely, yes. So, I mean, it's, in, that, in that setting, there's nothing more special, or you can't do anything simpler than you would do to just count geomorphic curves in an arbitrary symplectic, closed symplectic six manifold. I don't think there's anything special one can do. So you might have chosen your J so that if you choose your J generically, all the moduli spaces ought to have the right size, but only, of course, if you don't talk about multiply covered curves. So the fact, the fact that you can't rule out multiply covered curves means you can't use all these transversality arguments. What, what's preventing that here is that my curves are embedded near infinity. So morally speaking, I'm, I'm able to just avoid multiply covered curves. And so I can avoid all the, all of the technical issues that they bring. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Hmm. It's an important point though, this idea that taking quotients, so this whole story works for any hyperbolic four manifold that, you, that runs off to infinity. Um, ah, so, so it, it doesn't have, have to be some co-compact action, it can be... But no, no, yeah, exa exactly. So you, you could take your favorite hyperbolic surface and Take its, take its pi one acting, preserving a fixed copy of H2 inside H4. And then the quotient would be like a, an R2 bundle over, over your surface. And then the boundary would be a pair of copies of your surface, no, be your surface with circles, a circle bundle over your surface. And then this game would produce invariants of links inside the Riemann surface with a circle bundle over it. See, or, 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 or other versions of the same story. So what you would need to do then, you, the worry then would be that this space would have possibly more interesting compact geomorphic curves coming from the more interesting compact Riemann surfaces. But again, you'd perturb the J, and so the, the moduli space of compact simply covered curves would be discrete, and then you could avoid them with this infinite dimensional family of guys that run off to infinity. So in theory, the whole game would work then as well, and you'd produce another collection of link invariants. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. You're welcome. All right. So uh, I propose we thank Joel for his beautiful talk again. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joel. Really great talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great, yes.